Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part 10 of Cookie by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter 15. I woke up to see the sun streaming through a ch chink in the curtains. It was going to be another lovely sunny day in Rabbit Cove. I lay quietly beside mum fingering the stitching on the patchwork quilt looking at each seaside picture in turn. Then I heard a loud mewing right beside the window. I jumped up and pulled back the curtains. Two seagulls were balancing boldly on the window ledge, tapping their beaks on the glass in a jaunty fashion. Shoo, I said, tapping back at them. They flew off and I wondered what it would be like to soar effortlessly up into the sky. I spread my arms and whirled around and round the bed. Whatever are you doing, Mum mumbled. <laughs> Just having a little fly, I said. You are such a funny kid, said Mum, sitting up and stretching. Are you happy, babes? Ever so, ever so, ever so. I simply love it here. Can we go on the beach again and have another picnic? Of course we can. And do you think Mike was serious about letting me do oil painting? I think so. He's so nice, isn't he? Yes, he's a sweetheart. But I'm sure he's not charging us the full rate for the room. But I'm not going to argue, said Mum. She sniffed. Can you smell bacon? Mmm. We had a quick bath and then went downstairs to the breakfast room. There were two sets of couples wearing jeans and big woolly socks over their boots, obviously all set to walk along the coast path, and a family with a little boy and a toddler. Mike rushed in and out of the room in a big navy striped apron, bringing veggie sausage breakfasts for one walking couple, bacon and egg and black pudding for the other, baked beans on toast and boiled eggs with soldiers for the family. Mum just wanted a bacon sandwich, but I had a big plate of everything, and it was delicious. Mike was too busy to chat much, though he found the walkers a special map, and he gave the two little boys some tiny cars to race up and down their arms and round and round their plates. When the walkers and the family had all finished, Mike came and sat down at our table and had a cup of tea with us. It made us feel special. What are you two ladies planning for today? He said. The beach, I said. Well, I've got to clean all the bedrooms and do a spot of shopping this morning, said Mike. But this afternoon I'll be down on my usual patch with my paints and you're very welcome to come and do a bit of daubing with me, beauty. Mum and I had another lovely lazy morning at Rabbit Cove and a picnic on the beach. The family with the two little boys were on the beach too. I built a real sandcastle down on the damp sand near the sea and they came and helped me, finding shells and seaweed to decorate it and pouring water from their buckets to make a moat. Then Mike arrived and he had a small canvas especially for me. He'd even brought me a piece of board to mix my colours on and two different brushes, one fat and one thin. Okay, what are you going to paint, said Mike. A seascape? I think I'd like to do a portrait. A made up one. Is that all right? I asked. Of course it is, funny girl. You can paint whatever you want. So I sketched out a big figure that nearly filled the whole canvas. I squeezed dabs of blue and black and brown and red and white paint onto my palette and got started. It was such fun splashing on the thick paint. It stayed obediently where I put it. It didn't slop all over the place like watercolour. If I made a mistake, I could just wipe it off or decide to paint over it later. I painted a man with shiny brown hair and lovely blue eyes. I gave him blue jeans and I fiddled around with a smaller brush trying to give him a plaid shirt. It was a tricky work but not a lot of it showed because the man was holding a big white rabbit in his arms. It was hard making her look like a rabbit rather than a huge blob of marshmallow but Mike showed me how to make a pale grey and do little dabbing strokes of the brush to, to look like fur. I mixed up a perfect pink for the rabbit's little nose and I gave my man matching rosy cheeks. That's fantastic, Beauty, said Mike. He hesitated. So, uh, is that your dad? No, I said. It's Sam and his rabbit Lily. They're on the television. It's a little kid's program. I'm a big baby. I hung my head. Beauty, you're looking at a man who used to watch a little kid's program called The Magic Roundabout every single day. In fact, I have a daughter called Florence named after one of the roundabout characters. Luckily, she hasn't got a funny face and very big feet like the Florence Florence puppet. I didn't see any girl at Lily Cottage, I said shyly. Oh, no, 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 she's grown up now and lives in London near her mum, said Mike. Oh, I said nodding. We split up several years ago. My wife hated it here. How could you possibly hate Rabbit Cove? I said astonished. I started doing the sky behind Sam, realising that it might have made sense to fill it in first. Oh, Jenny likes city life. Bright lights, lots going on, lots of shops. She found it incredibly boring when I took early retirement and we moved down here. I think she probably found me quite boring too, said Mike. You're not a bit boring, I said. Mike laughed at me. <laughs> You're an incredibly polite girl, beauty. You've obviously been impeccably brought up by your mum and dad, so... He hesitated again. Where is dad? Back at home, I said. I hesitated too. I think maybe he and mum have split up too. 
just the day before yesterday, on my birthday, actually. Oh, dear. So where are you going to go after your holiday here? I didn't say anything. Painting green grass under Sam's feet. It went a bit blobby and lumpy, but I pretended the biggest lumps were lettuces for Lily. I was prying again, said Mike. I'm sorry. Take no notice. I'm so nosy. He tapped himself on his big cherry nose, telling himself off. I giggled, because he left a big smear of sand yellow paint on the tip. I think maybe you should wipe your nose. It's all painty now. Here, shall I do it? I said, brushing at him. I'm not really sure where we're going to go next. But Mum knows? Nope, we did go to Auntie Avril, but she couldn't have us for more than one night. I see. Well, what would you like to do, Beauty? I hung my head. Do you want to go back to Dad? Mike asked gently. No. He tries to be a kind dad and he spends heaps of money on me, but he gets so scary sometimes. He gets mad at Mum and me and he broke all the cookies and he let my, let my, my birthday rabbit out of its hutch and it died. I said all in a rush. I suddenly couldn't see my, any, my, my canvas anymore because my eyes were blurry with tears. Oh, beauty, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to upset you, said Mike, dabbing at my eyes with the much-used paint cloth. I thought Mum was asleep down on the beach, but she came dashing over the sand towards us. What have you said to upset her? she demanded of Mike. It wasn't Mike's fault, Mum, honest, I snivelled. I, I just thought about my rabbit. Oh, yes, uh, poor darling, said Mum, giving me a big hug. It was my fault, said Mike. I was asking stuff about her dad. I'm sorry, it was unforgivable of me. I was worried because Beauty let it slip that you haven't got anywhere to go. We'll be absolutely fine, said Mum. And you needn't worry about us not paying for our room and breakfast. I've got more than enough. Oh, Dilly, stop it. You know that's not what I'm worrying about. You don't have to worry at all, said Mum. Come on, Beauty, I think we'll go for a walk. But Mum, I haven't finished my Sam and Lily painting, I said. Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm getting a bit sick of stupid Sam and his... His lily, said Mum. Come on now. I glanced despairingly at Mike. Better do what your mum says, he said. So I miserably followed Mum along the sea front and up a little winding chalk path to the cliff top. I walked behind her, glancing at her back. She walked faster and faster, swinging her arms, her fists clenched. I lagged behind, out of breath. Keep up, beauty, Mum hissed. I don't want to, I said, and I suddenly sat down. Oh, come on, don't be a silly baby, said Mum. Stop bossing me about. Why are you being so horrid all of a sudden? You were so rude to Mike, and he was just trying to be kind. He made you cry. I'm not having that. You know why I was crying. It was because of the, my rabbit. Beauty, you spent five minutes maximum with that blessed rabbit, said Mum, squatting down beside me. I still loved it, and it was so terrible seeing it without its poor little head. I said, my voice going shaky again. I'll never forgive Dad for that. Never, never, never. Your dad didn't mean that to happen. I know he undid the hutch, but I'm sure he just meant birthday to escape. You mustn't blame him. Why are you sticking up for Dad? Yet you were being mean to Mike, who's ever so nice, and being mean to me too. I'm not being mean. Don't be so childish. I am a child. How else am I supposed to act? And you are being horribly mean. Why are you being so nasty, even saying Sam and Lily are stupid? Well, they are. And you're stupid being so obsessed with them. You're being a big baby, said Mum. I am not, I said, and shoved her hard. She was still squatting, and so she lost her balance. She fell backwards, legs in the air. Don't you dare hit me, she said. Do that again, and I'll hit you right back. I didn't hit you. I just shoved. This is a hit, I said, and I punched her shoulder. It was only a token punch, a feeble little tap, but Mum smacked me hard on my leg. I stared at her, shocked. She'd never, ever smacked me before. Mum seemed stunned, too. Her face suddenly crumpled, and she burst into tears. I don't know why you're crying. I'm the one who should be crying. That really hurt, I said. I'm sorry, Mum sobbed, her head in her hands. She cried and cried. I edged closer and then put my arm around her. She cried even harder, clinging to me. Oh, Beauty, I'm so sorry, she gasped. How could I have slapped you like that? You're right, I was being horribly mean. It's just I'm so scared. I don't know what to do for the best. I was awake half the night worrying about it. I think I've gone crazy running away with you like this. I haven't got any idea in my head what we're going to do. I couldn't stand Mike looking at me like that, acting so kind and concerned, when he must think I'm the worst mother in the world. He doesn't think that at all. He likes you. Don't you like him? Of course I do. I feel dead embarrassed that I was so snotty to him. I think we'd better be on our way tomorrow. Oh no, Mum, I love it here. I know, darling, but we can't stay here forever. Why can't we? This is just our little holiday, you know that. We've got to make proper plans. I've been trying so hard, but my head just goes whirling round and round. I've got so used to your dad telling me what to do, I can't seem to think for myself anymore. So I'll think for you. 
We'll stay here in Rabbit Cove, and you'll get a job, right? And we'll find our own little place. Oh, beauty, we couldn't even afford a blooming ble beach hut. Well then, I'll build us a blooming sandcastle, and we'll live in that, happily ever after, I said. Mum burst out laughing and hugged me tight. Oh, thank God I've got you, babe. We'll be fine, you and me, just so long as we stick together. I'm sorry I was so crabby. Are you going to say sorry to Mike, too? Oh, Lordy, yes, I suppose so. He has been sweet to us, and it was lovely him showing you how to paint. I'm quite good at it, aren't I? We don't really have to go tomorrow, do we? I so want to paint some more. We'll see, said Mum. When we walked back arm in arm, we saw Mike still perched on the wall, painting away. I don't think we'd better disturb him just now, said Mum. Oh, Mum, stop being such a coward. Let's get it over with, I said. I practically had to pull her over to Mike. Her cheeks went very red as we got nearer. He didn't look up, even when we were standing right next to him. He carried on dabbing paint onto his canvas in determined fashion. Mum pulled an agonised face at me. I gave her a nudge and she swallowed hard. Mike, uh, I'm very sorry for being so rude and offhand with you, she said in a tiny voice. Mike paused, paintbrush in mid-air. He looked up at last. I don't blame you. I was asking Beauty all sorts of silly questions which were none of my business, he said stiffly. Not at all, said Mum. Mike nodded awkwardly. Mum made little shuffling movements, about, a stri about to stride off again. I couldn't bear leaving it like that. So, to make friends properly, we'd like to ask you out to supper tonight, I said. Mum and Mike stared at me, looking equally astonished. Where? Mum mouthed at me. We discovered that Peggy's parlour closed on the dot of six last night, so we'd bought cod and chips from the fish shop and eaten them on the beach. That's very sweet of you, but I was actually planning a meal in tonight with friends, said Mike. Oh, I said, drooping. Yes, I do a great fish pie. Fancy trying it, you two? Well... We wouldn't want to intrude, not if you're having your friends round, said Mum. Mike looked at me. I rolled my eyes. Mum, I think we're the friends, I said. So, we had supper with Mike. We did wonder if he'd invited any of the other guests, but the two walking couples drove off to some gourmet pub and the family went to try the evening meal at the hotel. So, it's just us, I said, smiling. Mum, can I wear my grey dress and pinafore and my new boots? Oh, beauty, it's just supper. Just pop a clean t-shirt on and wear it with your jeans. No, I want to look lovely. Well, I know I look total rubbish no matter what, but I feel lovely in my grey dress. Oh, sweetheart, you don't look the slightest bit rubbish. But OK, you wear your grey outfit if you like. I'm not going to make a big effort, though. Mum wore her jeans, but she changed into her little pink clingy top with pearl buttons, and she wore her pink strappy high heels. She even bothered to paint new nail varnish on her toes. We went downstairs at seven, as Mike had suggested, but the breakfast room was empty, all the tables set ready for the morning. Oh goodness, maybe he's changed his mind, Mum whispered. But Mike came into the breakfast room, beaming at us. Through here, ladies. I thought we'd be cosier in the kitchen, and I won't give it, it won't give uh, any of the other guests ideas if they come back early. Mike had his stripy apron on, but underneath he was wearing a big blue flowery shirt and clean jeans without a single paint smear, and his big baseball boots shone scarlet. He had obviously made a big effort. Oh, Beauty. <laughs> Is it you, Beauty? He said. You look so grown up. And you look even younger, Dilly. You're just like sisters. We were used to people saying this, but it was still good to hear. We followed him into the kitchen. I'd expected it to be a big formal stainless steel working kitchen, but it was a glorious, colourful, old-fashioned room with a great wooden dresser hung with willow pattern plates. Old Toby jugs jostled each other on the windowsill and there were big blue luster vases on the wooden table containing red asters, white daisies, yellow lilies and pink rosebuds. The cooker itself was a big green agar that spread a cosy glow throughout the kitchen. There was a red and yellow and blue rag rug on the tiled floor with a black cat stretched out, comfortably dozing. I didn't know you had a cat, Mike, I said, squatting down beside it and stroking its sleek head. I don't. <laughs> it's next doors, but she's got a sixth sense whenever I make fish pie. She comes on the scrounge for the scraps, said Mike. Right, sit yourself down, girls. What would you like to drink? White wine, Dilly? And I thought you'd like a special red wine, Beauty. He grinned and poured us each a glass. Mine was the most beautiful deep red. I knew it couldn't really be wine, but I felt wickedly grown up, sipping it all the same. It's wonderful, I said. What kind of wine is it that that is this, Mike? Oh, the very best. Vintage pomegranate, said Mike. Now, you ladies talk among yourselves while I do the finishing touches to the meal. He popped some runner beans and asparagus into a pan of boiling water and then had to pe had a peer at the fish pie. It was golden brown and smelled wonderful. The cat raised her head from the mat and looked hopeful again. 
No, you've had your share, greedy guts, said Mike. It's our turn now. It truly was delicious. Soft, creamy mashed potato with a crispy cheese topping and large chunks of haddock and cod and curly pink prawns. I ate my entire plateful and then had a second helping. Mike didn't frown at me and make comments about my weight. He seemed delighted that I appreciated his pie and congratulated me on my appetite. Mum couldn't quite clear her plateful because she's got the appetite of a bird at the best of times, but she told Mike he was a brilliant cook. I'm not much cop when it comes to puds, I'm afraid, he said, producing a bowl of red apples, some purple grapes and an orange cheese. I'm not sure I've got any sweet nibbles for you, beauty. There might be a biscuit or two in that tartan tin. Are they homemade, I asked. Beauty, said Mum. No, sorry, I don't do that sort of baking, said Mike. Mum does, I said proudly. She makes the most fantastic cookies, all different sorts, iced and chocolate chip and cherry and oatmeal and raisin. Mmm, so you're a good cook, are you, Dilly? No. I've just got a very sweet daughter, said Mum. I can't cook for toffee apart from cookies. I can make good cookies, though. What about breakfast, said Mike. I'm going to need a hand in the kitchen now the summer season's starting up, and I usually employ a student to come in and do chamber meeting. It's a bit of a boring job, but you'd be finished and free by lunchtime. You don't fancy trying it for a few weeks. Mum looked stunned. She just stared at Mike, not saying a word. So I answered for her. Yes, please, I said. No, no, hang on, beauty. Mike's just being kind, trying to be helpful, Mum muttered. No, I, I need help. It's a bit of a rubbish job and I can't pay much, but it'll give you time to think about what you really want to do. The only trouble is I can't let you sleep, keep, keep the first floor double, not if you hear a staff. If I have a live-in girl, she usually sleeps up in the attic, but it's a bit basic, I'm afraid. The attic, I said, clapping my hands. Oh, can we see? I've always wanted to live in an old house with a proper attic. So Mike led us up the three flights of stairs to his attic. It was a dark, narrow little room with just one very small window, but it was still beautiful. The small bed had a navy patchwork quilt with silver stars and moons appliqued all over it. There was a squashy ruby velvet armchair with a matching footstool and a red and blue tapestry curtain hiding a clothes rail. Oh dear, I don't think it's anywhere near big enough for you, said Mike worriedly. We can easily scrunch up together. It's great, I said. I ran to the window, rested my elbows on the sill, and looked out over the red tile rooftops to the sea. I feel just like Sarah Crewe in A Little Princess. She lived in an attic. I knelt down, examining the, wain the wainscoting. Whatever are you doing, Beauty? Get up, said Mum. I'm just seeing if there are any little rat holes, I said. What? There are absolutely no rats in this house, I promise, said Mike. You won't find so much as a mouse's whisker. Oh, and I'd love my own pet rat like Sarah's Melchadeskic. I said. You might, Beauty, but I definitely wouldn't, said Mum. She smiled at Mike. We'll be great here, Mike, Beauty and me. I'll bring our stuff up here and start working in the morning. How about that? No, no, no. You must have your little holiday first. Please, I'd like to get stuck in straight away. Sh shall we shake on it? Mum stuck out her hand, and they shook, sealing the deal. And that is where we'll leave part 10 of Cookie by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated, guys. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye bye.